Hi, I'm Mark Andrew Allward, and I am writer for the blog The Loving Room, and it is my pleasure to be at First Unitarian Congregation of Waterloo today with Reverend Jessica Rodella. And thank you so much, Jessica, for taking the time this afternoon to uh, have an interview with me. Thank you. Um, my, first, uh, my first question would be, how long has there been a Unitarian presence in Waterloo Region? Uh, this congregation was started in 1956, and it was the first in the region, and actually the man who founded the congregation is still with us, still sits in the pews every Sunday. Oh, wow. And how many uh, different building uh, moves ha have there been? This is the third building that the congregation has owned, and there have been several other homes that it had uh, in interim spaces while it looked for a new home. Okay, perfect. And uh, I'd also like to thank our videographer, Wes Austin, for being here today. And I might invite him to move up a little bit, just for sound purposes. But um, also, um, my, my next question would be, how long have you been minister here uh, at First Unitarian? And uh, what is some of your, your, uh, your previous educational uh, and employment background before coming here? So I moved to Canada to serve this congregation in 2008. And... Uh, this is my first pastorate, so I'm a recent graduate of Meekville Lombard uh, Seminary, which is one of two Unitarian-specific seminaries. Uh, this one is in Chicago, and the, uh, our other one is in Berkeley, California. Before I was a minister, I was a high school English teacher, and uh, I also served as a freelance writer. I was a document conversion specialist back in the early days of the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've also been a weapons analyst. I did not know that. <laughs> I'm glad that I'm interviewing you because I'm learning new things. Um, and uh, so since you've been here, um, what changes have you seen in the congregation? Um, like, I personally have been uh, part of this congregation on and off for a few, several years now. Um, what changes have you seen um, since you've been here? Gosh, you might be better equipped to answer that question uh, than I am. Uh, in my four years here, what I've seen is a real growth of spirit as evidenced in uh, people's willingness to not want to miss what's happening here. We're also really growing in social consciousness. For a number of years, this congregation before I came here was in transition. And so, really thinking about how to settle into this building that they moved into just four and a half years ago, just before my arrival. Um, and also, uh, just in terms of uh, gelling as a community, and really understanding a Unitarian faith identity as the basis for social action and for the ways we live in the world, not just something that we do on a Sunday. Okay, great. Um, and which is actually leads um, perfectly into one of my next questions. And how far back, when we talk about Unitarianism in general, like we've, we've been talking a little bit about this congregation, um, how far back does Unitarianism go? Um, and who are some of the more well-known Unitarians? Because it's a, it seems very confusing to some of the people I talk with. They're like, oh, is it the United Church? Is it uh, the Unity Church? Uh, and I have to say, no, not them, it's not them, and it's Unitarians. So, um, so how far back does it go, and, uh, and sort of what are some of the key concepts of it? Wow, so big question. Yes. Uh, let's see, uh, my, my nifty uh, Unitarian Universalist history in 15 seconds yes. for us. Um, so we actually have roots in the Protestant Reformation, although arguably you could say uh, the doctrine of Unitarianism, where we were actually represented at the table at the foundation of the early Christian church. Uh, Unitarianism is the doctrine that uh, Jesus is recognized as teacher or in special status, but not a co-equal with God. And that was a dividing point then between uh, the Catholic church and what became known as the, the heresy of Arianism. Uh, which is basically Unitarianism as a doctrine. Um, it became an actual entity unto itself in the 16th century in Transylvania, of all places, uh, where the Transylvanian king was looking, you know, looking around Europe and seeing 
uh, nations being torn apart by religious warfare. And so he sought uh, a variety of the greatest religious minds in the area to consult him on what religion he should convert his country to. And Francis David uh, suggested that you let people choose their own faith, mm -hmm. that you let people pick their own beliefs. And so uh, Transylvania was the first place in which Unitarianism as a separate entity then began to arise. Okay. Now, uh, very good uh, uh, condensing, <laughs> condensing there. Thank you. It's a pretty big question. Um, and Francis David, like one of the quotes that uh, you use uh, a lot here at uh, First Unitarian is, of course, his, we need not th um, think alike to love alike. That's it. And it's on the back of our, some of our t-shirts as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, who are some of the other uh, sort of more famous Unitarians uh, that people might not know uh, were Unitarians? Um, I, I think that most famous ones that people will have heard of were the Transcendentalists and the American Literature Movement. So uh, Henry David Thoreau, Rob Waldo Emerson was a Unitarian minister, Louisa May Alcott, the author of Little Women, uh, all of these people were Unitarians. Mm -hmm. And am I correct that there were at least at least two American presidents early on that were Unitarians as well? Uh, John Adams and John Quincy Adams were stalwart Unitarians in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, now, next question is also a is a big question. Um, what what would you say um, about hmm, what do Unitarians believe? Um, I understand it's not a credo religion. There's no, there's no like Nicene Creed or or thing or, or something like that that uh, is in Unitarianism. So what holds Unitarians together? Uh, that is a good question. People have trouble articulating that sometimes because just in the way you frame the question to me, that's normally how we think of religion. What do you believe as the distinguishing mark? For Unitarians, we don't distinguish by what we believe, because within this congregation, there are as many sets of beliefs as there are individuals. So we're non-credal, that is, there's no set of beliefs that you have to ascribe to in order to be a Unitarian. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're gathered together under covenant, that is our promise of how we walk together, and how we promise to stand together to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning. And that's why on any given Sunday, in any given potluck or gathering or meeting, you will have, as I say, the Christian and the curious and the humanist and the humorist and the atheist and the agnostic and the pagan and the theist all worshiping together. Mm -hmm. I've heard the question asked before, what make that, in that case, what makes Unitarians a religion and not a social club? Uh, it, it's really about... Uh, being gathered together in a faith identity. Okay. And when we speak of faith as Unitarians, it's not faith as opposed to science or reason. It's faith that what we do in this world matters. So we're gathered not just in covenant to one another, but in covenant to the world to make the world a better place. I like to describe us as people of the Dutch. And that is, if you look at a gravestone, there's a birth date and there's a death date. Mm -hmm. And in the middle is the dash. Unitarians differ profoundly in how we believe we got here and what lies beyond. What matters is how we spend our time right here where we know we can make a difference, creating a beloved community. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's the heart of the religious quest. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I've also heard of, and this is a question that I skipped earlier, but I want to, I do want to address. Uh, down in the in the states, there is the Maine Unitarian Universalist Association, um, but here in Canada and in this congregation, in the name, there's only Unitarianism. So what, uh, why, what is the Universalist uh, connection to Unitarianism, and why is it not uh, so strong in here in Canada? So, uh, yes, probably even in the space of this interview, I've alternated between calling us Unitarians and Unitarian Universalists. And in fact, we are both. Um, in 1961, in the United States,
United States, the Unitarian movement and the Universalists merged. And that was because numbers in both were dwindling, and yet theologically we have so much in common. And so it was a discussion that had gone on for a really long time. In 1961, they formalized it. In 1961, the Canadian Unitarian Council was founded here, same year, mm -hmm. just a coincidence. Um, and it was just the Unitarians that created a national identity. And there were only, at the time, three Universalist churches in existence in Canada. So after the Canadian Unitarian Council was created, those three churches uh, asked to join our numbers, and the precedent, of course, had been set, set in the United States. Mm -hmm. But many of our uh, denominational affairs are still continental, uh, even though the CUC now operates separately from the UUA, Unitarian Universalist Association. Mm -hmm. So as ministers, we're all Unitarian Universalists, our uh, religious education uh, is combined uh, with the U.S. And, uh, Youth and young adult ministries in many ways have cross border connections. Okay, great. Um, I would, uh, I guess, I would, a question that I would ask is Was Unitarianism ever considered a form of Christianity? Um, or, or would you say it branched out of Christianity? Uh, because I've, heard, I've, I've been asked that myself before. Mm -hmm. Oh, Unitarians, you're Christians, you're just a different sort of branch. Is that the case or, 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 or not? It, it's a tricky question because most uh, modern Unitarians on this continent would not consider themselves Christians. Um, maybe uh, 20, 12 to 20 percent um, uh, would consider themselves to be Christians in any form. I think most mainstream Christians would not consider us Christian because of the Unitarian doctrine. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a creedal statement for most churches of recognizing the divinity of Christ. Um, but we're, we firmly came out of the Protestant Reformation, and it was uh, maybe until 60, 70 years ago, Unitarians would have considered themselves Christian. Mm. So it's a pretty modern development to think of ourselves as a group of atheists who haven't kicked the habit of going to church. Yes. So, um, but that's a surprise to some of the people sitting in the pews that, mm. by the way, you're actually part of the Protestant movement of yes. Christianity. And anyone just coming in, if you turned down the volume and watched a service here and looked at our order of service, it would be indistinguishable from most Protestant liturgies. That's right. You turned up the sound, you might notice some things are missing. Yes. Because we're, I'm always striving to be spiritually bilingual or trilingual mm -hmm. or, or even more so that people are able to hear and, and translate spiritually in ways that feel most useful for mm -hmm. them. Okay. Um, you just talked about the order of service and what people would see if they turned down the volume. And one of the things that they would see, one of the, the, the main things, is the chalice. Uh, is, is the, uh, the flaming, uh, if you call it the flaming chalice or the lit chalice. And um, so we have both the, uh, the lit chalice that is uh, uh, lit on uh, for Sunday service and also the, uh, uh, the one that adorns the front of the pulpit. Um, so I want to ask you about that. What is, is, is this the, the main symbol of Unitarianism? And the Christians have the cross up at the front of the church, but there's no cross here. It, instead, it's the chalice, and I'm just wondering a bit of, about what the, that means. Uh, the chalice is a relatively modern symbol for Unitarian Universalism, and it was, a, it, it was first created in 1940 by Hans Deutsch, who was working to um, uh, rescue refugees, Jewish refugees, uh, during the war. And he created this symbol actually for the Unitarian Service Committee, mm -hmm. uh, which is still in existence. And it became um, increasingly uh, identified with our movement and then finally adopted so that today, again on this continent, most of our uh, congregations would start a service by lighting the chalice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So my next question would be, uh, how is First Unitarian moving out into the community? Uh, you talked earlier about social justice, and um, so I'm, I'm wondering what the emphasis is on social justice here at, at the foundation. So I would contend that uh, social justice is our primary spiritual practice as Unitarian Universalists, that um, as
as people of the dash, then we are called to make a difference in community in the here and now. And we can leverage the power that we have as Unitarians in our communities as political activists. Uh, current projects that are on the go with us are, uh, we're looking at partnering with the Supportive Housing Project of Waterloo, the show housing, and we're just making the baby steps into building uh, what I hope will be a viable partnership in supplying volunteers and expertise and uh, other um, needed supports for that effort. I would love to see that effort really make a difference in the Waterloo region and be a model for how to house those people who are difficult to house. Mm -hmm. So that's one example. We also have uh, long-standing connections with Habitat for Humanity, and this congregation has uh, a history of sponsoring refugees, most recently a family from Colombia. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, another uh, change that's, that's going to be had, we've talked earlier about changes that you've seen since coming here, and um, and I, I personally, as, as part of the congregation, have seen many of, uh, many of those changes. I remember when we moved from a smaller building, uh, uptown Waterloo, on Dunbar Street, or Dunbar Road, uh, here to this much larger building than, than that one was. And then I remember when you were called to, uh, to minister here, and, and uh, how we all sort of sang you into the, into the sanctuary after the vote had been cast unanimously. And um, and I and I really know I really have noticed and uh, oh I skipped that question actually so I'm glad I'm getting to it now I, I I've noticed um, a couple different things in the last few weeks more young families when it's children's when it's children's story you know it's like you know half the con congregation that's a that's we're a, outnumbered yeah we're outnumbered there's so many kids young kids in this congregation and I've also noticed. To, uh, as well, that um, it seems like there is a lot more people from the LGBTQ community. So I wanted to ask that question: Where do, do Unitarians and this congregation stand on, uh, on the acceptance of, of the LGBTQ community? So Unitarians in Canada have uh, quite a great record. Uh, it, it's uh, in terms of LGBT rights. Uh, it was Canadian Unitarians that led the legal battle that led to making same-sex marriage a reality in Canada and still working quite hard for it in parts of the United States. Uh, so we were forerunners of that particular movement. In Canada, I think all but one of our 48 congregations are welcoming congregations, meaning that we've gone through a process of, of a, a kind of audit and education around how to be more welcoming to the LGBT community. Uh, I think that in this congregation, they started the conversation, I believe, in 1987. Mm -hmm. And finally, in 2001, um, voted to be a welcoming congregation. And we hang a rainbow banner in the foyer. So it is one of the first things everybody sees when they come through the door. Mm -hmm. um, I see it as really a symbol of success that I was called, uh, I'm a bisexual minister. When I came here, I, I did have a, a female partner, and that proved to be a non-issue. In fact, in this congregation, I think it's more controversial that my current partner is male. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, um, but I, I felt nothing but accepted here, and the fact that that was a non-issue was huge. Mm -hmm. because even being bisexual pushes the edge of the comfort zone that gets created in stages around the lesbian families and having uh, gay couples and having trans members and we do have uh, all of that represented here. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's lovely to be part of a congregation that's been so welcoming to my own lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, it's, been, it's uh, like, uh, uh, I hate to call it an issue, but I'm not sure what else to call it, but it's just so inclusion is, is so important to to myself and some of the other work that I do with uh, in other avenues of my life, and uh, to to have to be part of a congregation that is that that does uh, preach and and uh, teach inclusion and full acceptance is is something that's been very impressive. 
Well, thank you. And it, it's our goal. And really, the shadow side is that it's tempting sometimes for a group of people to get comfortable and believe the work is done. Yeah. And as I hold up uh, on a regular basis from the pulpit, the work is not done. There's still a lot of discrimination. The danger is that it can become hidden mm -hmm. as socially it becomes uh, less politically correct to criticize uh, LGBT issues in community, then sometimes the prejudice or misunderstanding can go underground. Yes. And so we're, we are continue to actively work on diversity awareness mm -hmm. and increasing the areas of our, um, increasing our comfort zones mm -hmm. so that we most learn from the challenges yep. that make us uncomfortable, not from the safe places where we can all agree theoretically yes. uh, that we all belong here. Let's practice what belongingness looks like mm -hmm. And the person who gets to judge how welcoming we are are, of course, the people on the outside not here yet. Mm -hmm. And it, it just seems that Unitarians have, have, at least for you know half of the century, been been on the leading edge of, of civil rights, of civil rights. You know, when it comes to down in the states during the Martin Luther King days, you know, as and then now with LGBTQ rights, you know, ministers have stepped up and and been part of the fight for uh, or fight or standing up for, for equality and acceptance. And that's something that's really impressed me. So. Well, we tend to stand at the liberal edge, the liberal most leftist edge of the edge. Uh, and, and that goes back to your question about, um, about how Christian, whether we're Christian or not, is that it's like we've moved almost through and beyond Christianity so that that doesn't become the final tent, mm -hmm. that there's more. Mm -hmm. And so we celebrate all six sources of that. And so we just kept moving out so that the edges of inclusion are bigger and bigger. So it is our hope to be foreigners. OK. Um, another change that's happening uh, very soon, and maybe you can tell us sort of when this might be happening, is that this will no longer be First Unitarian Congregation of Waterloo. But, uh, but will be Grand River Unitarian Congregation, as it was voted upon by the members. And uh, how is that process going, and uh, when will that name change be official? Well, we're hoping to roll it out officially in time for our annual water communion service, which will be September 9th, the first Sunday after Labor Day. It's mm -hmm. a traditional Unitarian in-gathering service. Mm -hmm. And we changed the name in part to name us after our vision. And so I think expanding the regional name to Grand River uh, shows that we're really throwing a bigger net mm -hmm. around who who is a part of us. Okay. Um, so we've learned that there's no set creed. Uh, there's no set, set creed here, but there are a set of principles and values. And I'm not going to ask you to name them all off because there's like seven principles, right, and eight sources or something. Seven principles, six sources. Six sources. But um, but what are some for you a couple a couple just a couple of the principles that that are sort of you know vital to to Unitarianism? So if you look at our statement of seven principles, it's really our covenant of how to be together, and the statement is that we affirm and promote um, these seven principles, and. It starts with the worth and dignity of every person as our first principle. Mm -hmm. And then in succession, each one, again, draws the circle of care a little bit wider up through democratic process and uh, working for equity and compassion in all human relations, and then all the way out to our seventh principle, which is affirming and promoting the interdependent web of which we are all a part. Mm -hmm. And so that's really our call to also be Earth-friendly Earth yes. and species-friendly, not mm -hmm. just our fellow people. And um, and the sources I've read through the I've read through the principles and the sources, but um, it seems like we, we we draw on and I say we because I'm a member of or I'm a part of this congregation right now. Um, we draw on anything every everything from Jewish and Christian you know Judeo-Christian teachings to uh, Earth-centered teachings, humanist teachings. Uh, it's like a whole sort of uh, salad of, of values uh, that we, that are sources that we draw upon. That, that's it. Our six sources 
don't narrow the field down of inspiration very much. This is good news and bad news as a preacher is that uh, I don't have any set lectionary that tells me what the order of the day is going to be. So anything on my bookshelf could be fodder for a message. And so we draw wisdom from prophetic deeds of men and women, uh, all the world's religions, uh, and, and as you said, all the way up through um, earth-centered traditions and those inspirations. Mm -hmm. And the meaning of that is just to explore that truth, it, for us, never is a capital T truth, that there are many truths reflected in the world's religions, and we stand to learn from any one of those mm -hmm. traditions. And so we celebrate that. And looking in our hymnals is a tour uh, through all kinds of different um, faith traditions and inspirations and teachings. Uh, last question would be, um, uh, what is your hope going forward for the Grand River Unitarian Congregation? Uh, what kind of place do you wish it to be, and where do you wish to, you know, uh, a congregation has to, you know, go along, and but where do you wish to sort of lead this congregation in the next uh, several years, in the next couple of years? I really have great hope that Unitarianism is a faith for the future. We're seeing more and more people come to the doors who have no church experience, or who, who have just felt really disaffected by the narrowness of whatever creedal faith they come from and are finding a haven and a home and a way to express their values in the world through Unitarianism. And it's my hope that if somebody were looking for us on a Sunday morning, they could pull into any corner store or gas station and say, hey, where's the Unitarian church? And yes. people would say, would know, mm -hmm. would be able to say, oh, those are the people who, yes. and fill in the blank with, with what lies in the future of this congregation in terms of making such a difference and such an impact in our community that we're known for that and uh, that we've built a reputation as community partners. And that's my goal, and that's the hope of growing this congregation from that very beginning in 1956 with 20 people in a room going, what if we started holding services mm -hmm. to today where typically 100 people gather yes. and in the future even more. That's the hope of growth. Growth in spiritual awareness, growth in community involvement, as well as just the growth in numbers that results from being a great place to be where you can make a difference. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Jess, for, for taking the time to have a sit-down interview about both the, the local congregation as well as uh, the big questions of what Unitarianism is, uh, is about. And, um, and I just want to close by, um, by reading the affirmation that is, uh, that is um, read by and, and, and affirmed by the entire congregation every Sunday. And uh, so I'll just read that in closing. Love is the doctrine of this church, the quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in harmony with the earth, thus do we covenant together. Thank you for joining us. Amen.